My name is Eris, and I do assure you that it is not in the sense now a name that I'm proud of. There was a time in the early years when I was quite proud to be a public enemy. I saw no wrong with it at all. I thought it was everyone's duty to support the law and when that had taken place, well, the retribution should follow. I believe that so many people in this still do believe an eye for an eye, the tooth for the tooth, the old law of Moses. But how strange it seems in a Christian country that the old law of Moses should be one to be taken as the gospel rather than the teachings of the Christ. John Ellis was born on the 4th of October in 1874 and served as one of the United Kingdom's top executioners for 23 years before retiring in 1924. During his service, he attended 203 hangings. The executions took their toll on Ellis, who sought peace in drinking alcohol and eventually attempting suicide following his retirement. As suicide was illegal, he was bound over for 12 months at Rochdale Magistrates Court. He eventually died by his own hand in 1932, when he cut his own throat. This as his story. John Ellis was born here in Rochdale and he grew up in this house here which is number 18 Broad Lane which is in the Balderstone district of Rochdale. Now Ellis's father, he was a barber, a trade which Ellis didn't initially want to follow. Instead, he worked as a textile machinist. And it was during a break in, in work that he and his mates were discussing an execution which had taken place the previous day. Ellis, a man of slight physique, who was then 22 years old, said that's the kind of job I'd like. His mates, they all laughed at him. Little did they know the man he would become. Five years later, after a factory accident, which left him physically weak. He opened his own barbers at number 413 Oldham Road. The building itself is still here uh, and it's this pink building right behind me the florist. So not only was it a barber's here, but it was also a news agent's. So Ellis would have been first to see the latest news from around the world, including the latest crimes and murders. Now whilst working here at his shop, he never forgot about the conversation he had with his friends back when he worked as a textile machinist and without telling his wife or parents he applied to the home office to
to become one of their listed executioners. Then one day, out of the blue, a letter arrived for Ellis. It was an invitation inviting him to London for training and becoming a hangman. Ellis's wife was stunned when she found out. Why on earth do you want to be an executioner? She asked him. I don't know, he replied. His mother was similarly outraged and totally opposed to the idea. I mean, Ellis, he couldn't even kill a chicken when he was younger, let alone execute someone. But Ellis, he was serious about it. And off to London, he went. Ellis arrived at Newgate Prison in London for his hangman training, which consisted of learning all of the intricacies of calculating drops, measuring them off, how to fix a noose and how to use restraining straps. He loved it and he knew he made the right decision. Ellis, he completed his training and he was added to the home office list of executioners. Initially, only as an assistant to other hangmen, at a rate of £10 plus expenses for the executioner and £2.10 shillings for the assistant. So he'd be on £2.10 shillings as he started as an assistant. Now Ellis, he returned home here to Rochdale. He was proud of himself. But months and months passed and he had heard nothing. Zip. He'd, he'd not been sent for by the Home Office to undertake any executions. And by this point, he was becoming very despondent. Then, in December of 1901, he received a letter stating that he was to act as an assistant to a double execution. And he would be assisting the official hangman, William Billington. Now, fun fact, William Billington was the son of a hangman from Preston in Lancashire called James Billington. Absolutely fascinating. Throughout his career, Ellis would work the majority of his time at his barber shop over on Oldham Road, where we've been. But when the Home Office letter arrived, requiring his service once, twice, perhaps three times a year, off he would go like a small businessman with his suitcase, travelling anonymously by bus or train to the particular prison where he, where he spent the night before the execution. They had certain rules to follow as executioners, such as where they could stay, when they had to arrive, how much alcohol they could drink, and when exactly they would get paid. And all executioners generally got paid two weeks after the execution. It was all quite strict, as you can imagine. Now, during his career as a public executioner, Ellis was involved in a number of high profile cases. He executed the infamous Dr. Crippen, who was noted in history as the first murderer to be captured by means of radio tele telegraphy. I knew I'd get that word wrong. Telegraphy. After murdering his wife in England, Dr. Crippen, an American by birth, fled 
the country and booked passage on the cargo ship, the Montrose, sailing for Quebec. Crippen was accompanied by his mistress, who dressed as a man in order to evade capture. The ship's captain became suspicious of the strange couple and telegraphed the authorities in England. Detectives from Scotland Yard arrived in Quebec before the Montrose had docked and they arrested Dr Crippen and his companion, another person he executed, who you may know if you've already subscribed to my channel. If you remember from my other video, the Alice Beetham story from Blackburn, where Arthur Burkett cut Alice Beetham's throat with a razor at the Jubilee Mill, almost decapitating her. I'll put a card up on the screen if you want to go and watch that video. It's a good video, good story. Well, John Ellis, he also executed Arthur Burkett for that tragic and gruesome crime. And that's one person I'm truly happy to see executed for what he did to poor Alice Beetham. Two executions which occurred in the latter part of John Ellis's career were the two that really affected him the most. The first was the execution of 18-year-old Henry Julius Jacobi at Pentonville Prison in London. Just the day before his execution, John Ellis watched him play cricket with the prison wardens and he later quoted, I saw the poor lad the day before his death. He was nothing but a child. It was the most harrowing sight I ever saw in my life. And I had to kill him the next day. Wow. So the second was the execution of Edith Thompson. The case which brings to mind very strongly at this moment as I speak to you is the case of Edith Thompson. Perhaps it's a long time ago and you may have completely forgotten all about it. But whether you have or whether you have not, whether society has forgotten, as it often does, sometimes even conveniently to suit itself, nothing can wipe away from my memory the terrible tragedy. There a woman, foolish woman, and they never could allow herself to be caught in the name of circumstances. And if a woman was innocent, she was, and yet her life was taken. Minutes before her death, Edith Thompson was in a state of collapse and had lost all control of herself. She screamed and sobbed and in terror at the prospect of her hanging and she ended up fainting. So whilst unconscious, she had to be supported on the gallows by four prison wardens. Ellis he placed the white cap over her head before pulling the lever, ending her life. The ordeal of executing Edith Thompson in 1923 truly had a profound effect on Ellis. 
John Ellis performed his final execution in 1924, when John Eastwood was hanged at Arnley Goal in Leeds. This was the 14th execution Ellis had attended that year alone. Then, in March of 1924, he tendered his resignation, ending a career he had followed since 1901. When Ellis retired in 1924, his shop over on Oldham Road became a bit of a tourist attraction, with people standing outside for hours just to catch a glimpse of him. He had denied all requests for newspaper interviews and refused to discuss his work. However, he couldn't settle. He also received no pension from the Home Office. And so he began drinking heavily. In August of 1924, he tried to kill himself. He put a gun in his mouth, but the bullet, it went right through his jaw. He was then arrested and charged with the then crime of attempting suicide, of trying to kill himself. Now the judge in court, he asked for and he received an undertaking that he would not attempt suicide again. And the judge quoted to Ellis, if your aim had been as straight as the drops you have given, it would have been a bad job for you. Your life has been lengthened and I hope you will make the best use of it. The spare life which has been granted to you. So Ellis returned to his shop and he tried just to continue life with his second chance. He received numerous offers to give lectures, but he eventually decided to go on stage and act in a play based on the true story of the infamous 19th century cat burglar and murderer, Charlie Peace. In the final scene of the play, John Ellis, he'd come on stage dressed all in black and he hanged him, or hanged the actor playing him. But the play, it caused uproar. In the press, it was bad reviews for its sheer bad taste and it was withdrawn at the end of its first week. So Ellis, he then put on a, a roadshow touring seaside towns and fairs giving demonstrations on the British method of execution, just using a full working model. The crowds, they'd pay him sixpence a time just to witness mock hangings. In 1932, Ellis, who had been still drinking very heavily, whether it was depression or the alcohol, he threatened his wife and daughter with a cut throat razor. His mind was troubled. He was in a dark place threatening his family with a razor and shouting, I'll cut your heads off. With 203 executions under his belt, his wife and children wisely fled the house. Ellis, he ran to the front door, chasing after them, reaching the threshold and without hesitation, he drew the razor across his throat, making a five inch gash cleanly across his neck. He collapsed and died in a pool of blood right there 
on the street. John Ellis now lies here in Rochdale Cemetery in a humble little grave. Neither the Home Office nor the prison commissioners were present at his funeral. Can you believe that? She was. So what I'm going to do guys, I'm going to leave John Ellis a wee magical stone from us to him. Right guys, so I'm going to put that there. Rest in peace John. A sad and traumatic end for a gentleman with a heart of gold, whose job deeply, deeply troubled and affected him, as it no doubt would affect anyone. Taking the lives of 203 of the most horrible and sadistic people of the time, no doubt would have played against his emotions. After all, it was only human. No doubt battling against his own instincts, regardless of his opinion of the crime or the perpetrator himself. He had a job to do, whether he agreed or not. He was the executioner. Now I want to share something with you. The voice recordings that you heard throughout the film of John Ellis speaking. These recordings are not the actual John Ellis talking. But through my research, I discovered a company called the Leslie Flint Trust. Now, Leslie Flint was a direct voice medium who who held seances, you know? And in one of the seances, John Ellis came through. So I got permission to share the recordings with you guys. The recording, the voices that you hear in the film are recordings are over 50 years old and they've been remastered and enhanced as best as possible. John Ellis came through to Leslie Flint, sharing intimate and invocative information. What you heard in the film are only snippets, but you can listen to the full recording and you can read the entire transcript by visiting the Leslie Flint Trust website of which I'll put a link in the description of this video. It's truly fascinating. Truly fascinating story, so go check that out, folks. So that's it. The incredible, true story. And possibly the first of my Hangman series. And what a first story. John Ellis, the Rochdale Hangman. Absolutely incredible guy. So thank you so much, guys. I really do appreciate you tuning in. And if this is your first time around here, hit that subscribe button and make sure you keep up to date with all my fascinating stories and historic wonders. So until next time, guys, you all take care and all the best.